Hi, it's Brendan Chaplin, and we are back. We are revamped, rebranded, and we're going to start with Strength and Conditioning TV coming at you. And I'm going to be bringing you really good interviews, really good exercise demonstrations and coaching, and interviews with athletes, interviews with coaches, and, and everything like that to inform and help you as a coach, as an athlete, to improve what you're doing. So today we're here with Ian Fisher. And you've got a better tan than me today. I'm, uh, you, you can tell you've been running around on the cricket pitches, haven't you? Yeah, we've had a pretty tough schedule at the minute. We've been outside, uh, well, we've been playing sort of, I think we might have played 25 out of 30 days with uh, yeah. some travel and practice days in between. So it's been a pretty full-on schedule for our lads. So Ian is the Head of Strength and Conditioning for Yorkshire County Cricket Club, Yorkshire. And you're doing pretty well this year, aren't you? You just tell me. We do, we, we're champions from last year and this year we're top of the table, 50 points clear at the moment with, with the game in hand, so we're looking, we're looking well set to retain our title which would be pretty special because it's, really cool. it's not done very often and you know, we've got a good group of players and it'd be a, be a really good achievement. And I know we're going to talk about strength and conditioning and, and sets and reps in a little bit but <coughs> I know a few months ago you were telling me a little bit about the kind of mindset, the team sort of culture. How have you held it together this year? What's been the difference that, that's made the difference? Wow, what a good question. Um, <laughs> I think um, the culture that we've got at Yorkshire is pretty, pretty long-standing. You know, I don't think it's, it's, it's really robust. So I, I think that's one thing that we've really got an advantage in, that we've built this culture over a long time. We've got an academy system. A lot of these players play together. So our culture, training ethics, um, what we have as our overall philosophies are well ingrained. Yeah. So that's a real advantage. And this year, I don't think there's been anything particularly different to that. It's just held up again and we've really performed, really performed nicely. Yeah, no, brilliant. And just give us a little bit of background on your S&C journey, if you like, because okay. we get a lot of people watching Strength and Conditioning TV and reading our website and blogs and, and on the mentorship programme who whose goal it is to get into a role like yours, so it'd be good to get your thoughts on that. Uh, back many moons ago, I was a, I was a professional cricketer, um, and how the cricket works is obviously the, we've got a quite intensive summer period and these long and winter breaks, which gives you opportunities to go play cricket abroad. And I did that, but I also started formulating a plan for after cricket where I wanted to work in, in exercise. Strength and yeah. conditioning wasn't established at that point. It was, you know, it was quite a long time ago, but um, as those winters went on, I got a few little qualifications, gym instructor and bits and bats like that. And I was getting a little bit of experience working in gyms. Um, but then as my career progressed, these roles started cropping up within cricket, strength and conditioning. Um, I didn't really have this big plan to get back into cricket. That wasn't, um, that wasn't a big plan. I just, when I left cricket and I thought, right, I'm going to do strength and conditioning, I just wanted to work with athletes. I wanted to work in, you know, performance sport. Um, I studied at Leeds Beckett. Um, I saw that as sort of one of my um, best methods of, of really, of progressing from where I was then. I thought I needed some underpinning knowledge. Uh, then I was lucky enough to be an intern under yourself, um, which was really good hands-on coaching experience. You know, I still, I still champion it now of how sort of I was spending six hours a day in the gym at times and coaching lots of different athletes, lots of different programming considerations. So um, that was a real fast track to my learning. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, being an S&C coach with a professional cricket background, my value or my added value probably was back in cricket where I had some extra skills that I could that I could take with me so I got a job back in cricket so that was you know after working a little bit self-employed and a little bit as an intern then I then I ended up back in back in cricket as a SNC yeah. coach. Yeah. That's really interesting because there's, and there's a couple of things specifically there that I think are really almost helpful to people. The first one very simply is that you, you gave up your time you did what was needed to be done to kind of, I suppose, earn your stripes as a, as a credible S&C coach. So, you know, you were doing a lot of coaching for not a lot of money, if, if any money, back in the day. But it made you into a great coach, didn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I, I did. I worked so much for free. But I, it was, I was, I've been speaking to some uh, mentees, actually, about this, about where 
you actually there's a point where you're you actually have to put some um, value on your time because I used to just give my time away for I'd yeah. be going yeah I'll do a session I'll do yeah. I'll do three yeah. sessions just come in just come in. just to get some time in the gym get my hands on people but then there's a point where and to me it was you know finishing my degree UKC and then it's like I need to put some value on my time here I need mm. to start mm. charging people for yeah. for delivery if it yeah. if it's you know outside of what I what I deem as just my learning experience so yeah and and I think the other thing that I want to as well discuss which was interesting was that point where you are added value within cricket and it's something that I always talk to, to people on our mentorship but in general about how how can you add more value so you had the cricket background and quite clearly that's a, an asset to you mm. but we've all got other ways we can add value other than say for yourself being in, a part of the cricket community and the culture um, so for me on the MMA side I, I've got that sport specific yeah. background but it's not about a sport necessarily it's about how you can add more value and and do what other people can or do what other people won't do and um, so whether it's being able to to print off some excel spreadsheets to show that whether it's just doing that extra bit when it comes to like working in with the team on, on the team journeys just any, anything you can do it really isn't it to to add that extra little bit of value to differentiate yourself yeah i, I was just about to just about to interrupt and say yeah my my the skills of my added skills that i feel that will stand up in in any sporting environment because i think what i had in cricket was i I got because it's such a long game. You spend a lot of time there. I always, I've always invested in relationships um, to build trust, to build buy-in. So, and that's really important, especially in cricket, where strength and conditioning's a little. It's it still needs establishing further and further and further. It, yeah. it is a professional sport. It's been a professional sport for a long time, but it's still there. Are still a little bit like, ooh, ooh, should they be doing all that? Should you know? Should, mm -hmm. So. There is still a trust element, and that's where I've got added value. That because of my ex cricket background, they go, "What you want him doing that again?" Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. He knows what he's on about. Mm -hmm. So I get that. I, it's the that building trust, building rapport, building relationships with mm -hmm. key stakeholders, coaches, directors of cricket, athletes in particular, obviously. Yeah. Um, but building those relationships first yeah. Yeah. before you start instigating or revolutionising anything. Yeah, no, I get that, Ian, because I think, for me, I've, 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 you've probably seen a couple of my talks when I talk about that, that the, really the key to success in S&C and in fitness is, is building those relationships, because ultimately, people have got to believe in you, people have got to trust you that your intentions are there and that you, you value them yeah, yeah. before you start, as you suggested, making or trying to make big changes. So earn that trust and earn that belief and that buy-in, I think, is, is a key lesson, isn't it? Yeah. When you want to get what you want done, really. Mm. Ultimately, we, we're, trying to, we're trying to get people to do things that they don't necessarily want to do, so we've got to in, educate them and engage with them a little bit, haven't we? Absolutely. It's the old, um, nobody, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, that classic <laughs> cliche. It's a cl like it. it is very, very <laughs> boiled cliche. So let's, let's move into your strength conditioning programme. Yep. So... We're in August now, and obviously it's kind of tailing off the season. So, what are you doing at the moment with the with the players for their for their fitness? So, like you say, it's um, getting to the business end of our season. There's about six weeks left, um, and the guys are getting a little bit more beaten up by the cricket. So, um, it's such a condensed program is cricket that right from right from day one, you've got to have. A clear philosophy of how you want to, the guys to train through their through their sport, um, because at times they've got to train almost through it, almost in games. You know they are getting sessions in during games, in some downtime and um, around practice. So we have a general philosophy of trying to keep the guys strong. You yeah. know, in terms of we don't get a lot of contact. Sometimes there's a four-day game, a one-day game in a week, a travel day, and a practice. So get something in that. And then, so we get lots of contacts in terms of warm-ups and we can get plenty of regeneration sessions and mobility sessions. But meaningful S&C, my philosophy is every time I get a contact, let's try and get a strength session done yeah. and keep their, their 
maximum strength as high as possible, their robustness up to deal with the, you know, the, the rigours and forces that they're dealing with in cricket. So what, give, us, give us some exercise examples then, or give us a kind of session that you've done in the last week or so, roughly, just take us through what exercise is, what sets and reps you're doing now. So, yeah, there's, not, there's nothing uh, too groundbreaking, it's really fundamental. The younger guys tend to, tend to squat, stiff leg deadlift, press and pull. Yeah. That is their, you know, four big bang strength exercises, um, four by fives or, or five by threes tend to be my, my in-season uh, rep protocols and then I tend to individualize or specialize each program with three um, bolt-on exercises that are, tend to be really specific to them it might be ankle work uh, postural work and trunk work yeah. uh, which yeah. is pretty standard as well yeah. if you're if you're a bowler but um, that's you know general session the older guys tend to be a little bit less mobile in the hips so I tend to make their higher strength exercises more trap bar deadlift which are yeah. a little bit friendlier um, for those sort of joint range of motion so they might have trap bar deadlift uh, split squat or riff or bulgarian yeah. Um, yeah. a push and a pull yeah. so that's how the that's how the program's going like i say we've got a session coming up they've got a little bit more time off this week so i'll get through one of those sessions at least and yeah. then there'll be some little bits of add-ons for extra players that are Cool. That are coming back from injuries, etc. And stiff leg deadlifts. Why, why are you going with a stiff leg over, say, um, a single leg version or a, a, a lunge with forward reach or a Nordic? What, what, what's your what's your preference to the stiff leg deadlift? There. What I'd say is stiff leg deadlift is a real staple in our program. It's yeah. a good sort of high load, eccentric strength yeah. control exercise. So. Um, the guys are pretty well adapted to it. It doesn't beat them up too much. We do have single leg versions in there. We do have, we do do Nordics as well. You know, there's, it's not our only hamstring, you know, hamstring yeah. exercise, but it is something that we've we put in there just because it's it's an exercise that we've we use a lot, and the guys get a decent bit of load through through the hamstring in that. No, it's a, it's a great exercise for sure. And outside of the gym. Is there anything that you're still doing now in season on the kind of movement side, the plyo side, the um, mobility side that, that's worth mentioning? We, as I said, we get loads of we get loads of warm ups. So you get that, you know, everybody's going to tell you to utilize your warm ups well because yeah. it's 15 minutes or 20 minutes with your athletes daily that gives you an opportunity to do something good. That's practically that's really good, but you get 15 cricketers who've been there two weeks and only had two days off then they're a little bit grumpy in warm-up yeah. so yeah. you've got to balance that we need to have a bit of fun in warm-ups or we need to you know we need to do something that's quite entertaining warm-ups and what do I really need to do what am I um, minimalist approach rather than optimalist approach um, I do a lot of hops you know we do a lot of control elements so our warm-ups consist of mobility glute activation control some hops and then I tend to base my movement stuff on linear acceleration and a little bit of change of direction stuff so that is how I sort of yeah. try and get that through every warm-up yeah oh, good that's great and the other week I came in here mm -hmm. and I walked around the curtain there yeah. and there was a, a scantily clad female mm -hmm. performing amazing movement patterns and um, touching her toes everything like that and all the lads were there copying it and i guess that was some kind of yoga session wasn't it it's <laughs> cancelling class i'm thinking i got told off around the uh, the the, uh, the the curtain there so so what they're doing some yoga so yeah about two years ago we um put in an intervention of yoga you know we had we when i came into the club we screened the guys did a and I sat down with a physio, um, and we sort of said, "We all that. We don't move that well here. You know, we got yeah. range. Of, the physio does his bed tests. I do. You know, I'm lucky. We've got an integrated team. The physio's saying I'm seeing this on the bed. I'm seeing these ranges of motion. How do they move in the gym? We did fun functional movement screening. I'm going mm, yeah. not amazing. You know, hips, hamstrings, ankles, all. You know, T-spine rotation. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things to be addressed. So we said we had a we get those winter periods where you get five months with them. So let's try yoga. So we yeah. 
we did yoga and we pretty belligerent on it because you know getting something in where guys are stretching for an hour is is not easy but it held it steadfast and we um we did it all winter and then have tried to maintain that through the summer it's not just as regular in the summer but um yeah we've been doing it almost two years now and yeah. it's yeah. i think it's going well it's one of those things that's difficult to quantify but i perceive that guys are moving better in the gym you know in their yeah. in their global gym based movements um not necessarily all because of yoga because we've got a, you know we've got an approach to getting lots of mobility done and you know physios hands on there's a lot of lot of factors that go into moving well mm. um so so yeah it's just part of the holistic approach to good movement i think yeah, yeah. well I, i've always said it that it's 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 not enough to do 30 seconds of, of stretching at the end of a session or the start of a session or even at a separate session it's just not good enough to develop flexibility mm. and the best results I've ever had as a coach when we've talked about movement is when we've done prolonged stretching, developmental stretching. Yeah. And I suppose, like, forget the kind of the fancy mobility drills. It, th those types of things do, <coughs> do really help to improve the shapes that you're trying to make, I believe, anyway. And that's, that's what yoga is. It's an hour of coached stretching, isn't it, really? Because yeah. yeah. it's quite bespoke to to our cricket needs, you know, she doesn't have us in lots of kneeling positions and lots of um, positions that are going to beat our sort of knees and ankles up. It tends to be a lot more upright and a lot more sort of hip, hip opening mm. style yoga poses and some shoulder and, yeah. and T-spine um, mm. work. So, so yeah, it's quite bespoke and it's an hour of coach stretching. You yeah. know, you've got some long holds and it's, yeah. uh, it's yeah. fairly challenging, mm. but... Um, but where do we do that as coaches in our programs normally? If, if you take the yoga out and you think, how are we replacing <coughs> that developmental work? Very often it doesn't get replaced, does it? No, and you know, I to try and stick some stretching on either at the beginning or the end, it's never it's never done yeah. quite the same. And it's a different voice as well. It's somebody yeah. else saying it. If, if you did it or the physio mm. did it, it doesn't come from the same place. The the adherence or the the engagement in that session is not as great. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I've also got a real um, belief in terms of making guys lift through full ranges of motion as well. You know, not not cheating that, not cheating little bits of range to just get a few more numbers on the bar. And I'm lucky, I suppose, with, that we get these extended off-season periods that I don't feel like I've got to chase numbers. You know, if you've got a lot of rubber players and you're thinking, right, I've got to get them strong in six weeks, then you might just trim your philosophy on that a little bit. You're like, going, we've got to keep getting, we've got to keep mm. getting some strength in it. Mm. But because I get a bit of a period like that, I can say, no, we, we're hitting that box. Until you hit that box, you know, every rep for, five, for four sets of five, then we don't put any more weight on. So I, I get, I'm lucky I can do that. Yeah, yeah. And the lads survived their grappling wrestling session with me, didn't they? They're still going on about it, to be honest. But <laughs> <laughs> when is he coming in again? <laughs> I, I, I walked in, I walked into this centre, this cricket centre the other week. I saw one of the lads who was present at the at the wrestling session that I did the other, about, probably about two or three months ago, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and he literally just went for me. He just kind of ran at me. <laughs> did he? Tried, yeah, yeah. It was it was Hoddy, and uh, he's a good athlete as well. But uh, we had all the mats set out here and we were just partnering up doing like really basic wrestling drills and even a sport, the, the point I'm trying to make is even a sport that really is non-contact, not really associated with any kind of movement patterns in that way, it was still an engaging fun session and a, and a great fitness session for them in a sense, wasn't it? Absolutely, I, I'm all for this um Cross training, cross training methods. At times, you know, you just got to pick appropriate times for it. It was, yeah. it was in our off season. It was great. That you know, it was a bit of fun. I actually packed it into what I called like a transition week, where we did mm. gymnastics that week. We did the grappling. We did some. Um, this football coach came and coached us some yeah. goalkeeping skills. So I sort of put it into a week where let's just do some different things. Let's yeah. embrace a bit of. Um, a bit of sort of chaos within our within our sessions and it was it was exactly that it was really good fun yeah cool okay well we'll we'll get you on the box again in probably sometime around the uh the the 
pre-season, so back into the autumn, and yeah. we'll, we'll catch up with you and see what you're doing then. Um, but we'll we'll get some more stuff as well. <clears throat> That's when I get a bit more excited about it because I'm getting yeah. like four or five regular hits each each uh, week with the guys, and it's yeah. a bit more. Uh, and it's yes, your programme. Yes, it? we're doing some good work yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. So we'll definitely do that. And. That's been me, Brendan Chaplin, and Ian Fisher talking strength and conditioning on Strength and Conditioning TV. We'll be back with you again very soon with some more quality content. Thanks for listening.